Welcome to worship. In the book of Revelation, we read God's words. I will be their God, and they will be my children. So come and worship the Lord, the mother, father, and carer of us all. Let us pray. Faithful God, we come into your presence with thankful hearts, deeply grateful for the unfailing love and faithfulness you have shown towards us, your people. When we call out to you, you always answer. When we are exhausted, you give us the strength to go on. When we find ourselves in trouble, you are there standing beside us. And so we come before you, with gratitude and praise, offering you the worship of our hearts and lives. Open our eyes to see and know you here among us. Open our ears to recognise your voice. And when this time of worship is over, send us out from here in the name of Jesus, filled with your spirit, to live and work in the world as your faithful disciples. Father, we come before you now recognising you as the God of compassion. If you kept a record of our sins, who would stand? We come before you with our brokenness and our wounds for all to see. We bring our anger, our bitterness and the emotions and actions we know deep in our hearts hurt you and those around us. We try to do good, but sometimes fail. We choose to do the wrong thing and sometimes succeed. We rely on your promise to forgive us when we confess to you completely. Without you, we have no hope. When we hear you say, 
My child, your sins are forgiven. It is balm to our souls and we fall before you in praise and wonder. Receive our prayer, Father. Receive our love and receive our lives in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. And we say together the prayer that Jesus gave us in the modern translation. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Did you know Jesus had a family? It was one that he grew up with. Brothers, possibly sisters, who he played with, and his parents, Mary and Joseph. Let's watch this video to find out a little bit more about them. Come and see Jesus growing up. This is Jesus. Hey -oh. Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in a barn because there was no room at the inn for him. Jesus had a mom named Mary Hi. and a dad named Joseph. Hey -oh. Jesus grew up in a small town called Nazareth. Jesus had brothers and sisters. One of his brothers was James, Hi. and he followed Jesus his whole life. Hey, Jesus, wait up! Jesus also had a cousin named John. Hey, John. Hey, Jesus. Who would later be known as John the Baptist. Mom, we're home. Jesus was an Israelite, and his family practiced the Jewish customs and holidays. Jesus. Everyone who knew Jesus liked him. Jesus' earthly dad was a carpenter. What was that? Ah, I see. Jesus learned from Joseph and became a carpenter himself. As Jesus grew up, he learned more about God and what his plan was. He studied the word of God and remembered all that it said. Jesus prepared himself for everything that God wanted him to do. So when it was time, he was ready to be the Messiah, the promised savior of the Israelites and all of mankind. But Jesus also had a bigger family who followed him and learned from him. We call that the church. And we are all members of that family. Okay, we're gonna sing. I invite you to do the actions. And that means everyone, the whole family of God. Some of us are big and tall, some of us are very small, some of us like pink and some like blue. Ducks. That's because we're different, me and you. But God loves everyone He's made. God loves each of us in a special way. That's you and me. Thank you. 
So Jesus was travelling around the towns and villages, making people feel better in every way. And one day he found that the crowd who were following him had got so big that there was no room or time to even stop and have his tea. Someone told his mum and his family and they came to find him. Jesus said, My family does what God says. It's more than just my mum and brothers and sisters. Look at these people here. This is how Mark tells it in the Bible. The reading is taken from Mark chapter 3, verses 20 to 35. Jesus entered a house. Again, a crowd gathered. It was so large that Jesus and his disciples were not even able to eat. His family heard about this, so they went to take charge of him. They said, he is out of his mind. Some teachers of the law were there. They had come down from Jerusalem. They said, he is controlled by Beelzebul. He is driving out demons by the power of the prince of demons. So Jesus called them over to him. He began to speak to them using stories. He said, how can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom fights against itself, it can't stand. If a family is divided, it can't stand. And if Satan fights against himself and his helpers are divided, he can't stand. That is the end of him. In fact, none of you can enter a strong man's house unless you tie him up first. Then you can steal things from his house. What I'm about to tell you is true. Everyone's sins and evil words against God will be forgiven. But whoever speaks evil things against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. Their guilt will last forever. Jesus said this because the teachers of the law were saying, he has an evil spirit. Jesus' mother and brothers came and stood outside. They sent someone in to get him. A crowd was sitting around Jesus. 
they told him, your mother and your brothers are outside. They're looking for you. Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? He asked. Then Jesus looked at the people sitting in a circle around him. He said, here is my mother. Here are my brothers. Anyone who does what God wants is my brother or sister or mother. Amen. Families, eh? I speak from experience when I say, just because you're family doesn't always mean you'll get on with each other. As I was thinking about what to say today, I wrote the word family in the middle of a blank piece of paper. And around it, I added these words, care, love, concern, shared experience, loyalty, support. And then I paused, pen raised from the page. And I remembered an advert from a building society a few years ago where the man said, it doesn't work like that. Or at least not for all of us. Because just like building societies, our families do not always do what works best for everyone. Now, have you ever had to skip a meal because you are too busy? Or because people are demanding too much from you? I wonder if Deliveroo or Just Eat would survive if people gave stopping to cook and sit down together for a meal together a higher priority. Now in our reading, Jesus has attracted such a large following that he isn't even able to stop for his tea. And as people bring their needs, he is healing them. News is spreading and the crowd is getting dangerously large. It seems that someone has told his family. Probably Mary and his half-brothers and sisters. Has Jesus lost his mind? Do they come out of concern for him? After all, it looks like he hasn't eaten. Or for the good name of the family? We're not told. I stopped when I read this part and thought, hang on a minute though. Doesn't Mary know exactly what Jesus is doing? She knew from the start who he was. After all, the angel Gabriel had told her personally. Perhaps then it was her other sons who didn't agree. And it was they who thought he'd gone off the rails. After all, according to the culture of the time, it would have been the sons who made the family decisions, as there's no mention of Joseph rather than the mother and the sisters. It seems that Jesus' half-brothers were not on the same page as their famous sibling. The teachers of the law had their angle on this too. They had never seen anything like it and would have been worried about their status as the authorities on which people relied. Jesus was driving out evil spirits and they thought it must be the chief of the evil spirits that was doing this through him. Perhaps this was not what they themselves had ever seen happen. In fact, the teachers of the law turned out not to be on the same page either. Both parties get a stern rebuke from Jesus. Jesus talks about unity, about the strength that that brings. He uses the analogy of a kingdom and that of a family. Both are only strong if they're united, not through driving out their own people. Neither his brothers nor the teachers of the law understood what he's doing or why. And it's for this reason that he takes the idea of family and uses it to teach us that living according to God's will for us is what makes us a true family, his family. It is believed that two of Jesus' half-brothers, James and Jude, later joined the growing church. 
and we have a letter from each of them in our Bibles. And they're mentioned also in the book of Acts. I've no doubt Jesus would have been praying for them, as many of us are doing for our family members who have yet to meet Jesus for themselves. James and Jude eventually became part of Jesus's spiritual family, as well as his biological one. So what must we do to truly be part of Jesus's family? Well, he tells us we must live according to God's will. We are to trust and obey, learning from and following Jesus. Sitting around in a circle around him, as it were. Let's reflect on what that means in our lives as we sing our next hymn, holding the words of the last verse in particular in our hearts, as we ponder what it means to be truly a part of God's family.
So what makes God's family work well together? What does it look like to trust and obey? Like a biological family, we have a shared parenthood, albeit an adopted one. Our new birth in Christ means we are related, at least spiritually. As baptised Christians, we are born of water and the Spirit, washed clean and filled afresh. We have that in common. It is part of our spiritual DNA. So in that sense, we can be said to be related. We are indeed members of the family of God. All different and yet all the same. In our reading, it's clear that Jesus affords a different significance to his family of followers, those who are sat around him in a circle, than he does to his biological siblings who haven't yet understood. Now, my dad used to refer to other Christians as brother and sister, and I used to wonder why. What was that all about? Well, our reading today helps me to understand. So if we apply Jesus' idea of family to ourselves, then can we say that we are, in spiritual terms at least, sat in a circle around Jesus? Are we like that early group, hanging on his every word and deed, growing together as a community with mutual concern and provision according to need at its centre? These people are beginning to do life together. Perhaps many of them leaving behind but earnestly praying for unbelieving members of their biological family too. Now Charles Wesley wrote a hymn about how we are to live as God's family. And from the words and images he uses, it's clear that Jesus is our model the person in whose name we strive to work together. So let's listen carefully to Wesley's words. The reading is from Singing the Faith, number 686. Jesus, Lord, we look to thee. Jesus, Lord, we look to thee. Let us in thy name agree. Show thyself as Prince of Peace. Bid our jarring conflict cease. By thy reconciling love, every stumbling block remove. Each to each untie, endear. Come and spread thy banner here. Make us of one heart and mind, courteous, merciful, and kind. Lowly, meek in thought and word, altogether like our Lord. Let us for each other care, each the other's burdens bear. To thy church the pattern give, show how true believers live. Free from anger and from pride, let us thus in God abide. All the depth of love express, all the heights of holiness. So what was it that made the community of believers at that time and in the years to come stand out from the rest of society? What was their USP, their unique saving point, perhaps? They were made up of people from all sections of society living together as one, distinctive in a strictly socially demarcated world. In the book of Acts, we're told that the early church worked hard to meet each other's needs. And in the time before his ascension and before the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost, Jesus' disciples also followed his lead by providing for the needs of the ever-growing group of followers. They loved each other and also those who were not yet part of the group. They were selfless, not selfish. And in a world where social and racial distinctions were clearly marked out, their model for community was distinctive. 
they grew and grew. And today, the family of God stretches across the whole earth. Back then, the followers of Jesus could sit around him in a circle. Today, we do that in a variety of ways across the whole world. Our challenge is to continue to be active, distinctive, and caring members of this one great fellowship of love. Amen. In Christ there is no east or west, in him no south or north, but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide earth. In him shall true hearts everywhere their high communion find. His service is the golden cord close binding humankind. Join hands then, all the human race, whatever your nation be. All children of the living God are surely kin to me. In Christ now meet both east and west, in him meet south and north. All Christ-like souls are one in him throughout the whole wide earth. Now come to the time of prayers for others. Let us pray. Father God, the creator of the earth and all that is in it, we come before your throne of grace, not because we have done anything deserving of your kindness, but you are a compassionate God who loves and cares for us. Bless our families from all that might bring them harm. We pray that you bless all families as they are the building blocks of your church and the communities in which they live. As members of the body of Christ, Father God, we commit families to you as the family unit is constantly under attack, yet it is your intention that a family be a place of love, nurturing, and thriving relationships. We pray for healing and peace for the stresses and strains within family relationships. We pray for couples who may have lost the love they once had as their lives drift apart, we pray for parents who no longer can control their children and children caught up in gangs, drugs, and other ills. We pray for healing and peace. Father God, may you protect families from harm and evil. May you always go before them and prepare the way for them. You are the Lord who says to the prophet Isaiah that you will make straight any crooked paths. Many families face the challenges of separation, divorce, violence, financial challenges, sickness and bereavement, especially due to the pandemic. Some families have had members experiencing mental ill health, exploitation and abuse. We bring such brokenness before you, Lord, and plead with you that you be the God who comforts the bereaved, protect the vulnerable and exploited and bring justice for the oppressed. There are some who face loneliness, are invisible to society, to the authorities, and only survive via the generosity of charities and church organizations. We pray for the welfare and protection of little children caught up in the fallout when relationships break down. Lord, help us to be a blessing to one another and to others. Lead us in your ways.
grant us compassionate hearts, fill us with your love that keeps no record of wrongs, but to pursue justice through the one great commanded Christ Jesus taught us, that is, love. Your word challenges, challenges us to have only one debt and outstanding, that of loving others as ourselves, for love covers over all wrongs. Merciful God, we bring before you the many families torn apart and affected by conflicts around the world, especially those in the Middle East, for the many migrants perishing at sea as they seek what they perceive as better livelihoods. So, Lord, we pray that you restore the love in families and that they be about sacrifice and love as the example of Christ who is head of his church that he loves so much that he gave up his life for the atonement of their wrongs. May your peace, love, and presence draw near to us at all times. Lord God, may you hear our prayers. Amen. Our prayer of dedication as we make our offering to God. Heavenly Father, you have given us riches beyond measure. We can only return a fraction of what we owe you. But we ask that you will bless our offerings and help us to use them wisely in your service and for your glory. Amen.
So now we leave this space of worship. And while so much of the road ahead is uncertain, the path constantly changing, we know some things that are as solid and sure as the ground beneath our feet and the sky above our heads. We know God is love. We know Christ's light endures. We know the Holy Spirit here, found in the space between all things, closer to us than our next breath, binding us to each other until we meet again. Go in peace, in the name of Christ. Amen.